I am audible. Yes, sir, you are. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening to you all and welcome to the results call of ICC Prudential Life Insurance Company for the nine months ended December 31st of the current financial year 2022. I have several of my senior colleagues with me on the call. Satyan Jambunadhan, the CFO. Judajit Das, who heads Human Resources, Customer Service and Operations. Amit Palta, who heads Distribution, Brand and Marketing and Products. Deepa Kinger, who is responsible for Audit, Legal, Risk and Compliance. Manish Kumar, who manages investments. Uh, Shavik Josh, appointed actuary. Dhiren Salyan, our deputy CFO. And Mukesh Bubana from the Investor Relations team. As you are aware, as a country, we are seeing a fresh surge in COVID-19 infections beginning the last week of December 2021. Our thoughts are with the families who are grappling with health issues, lost lives and livelihood issues. We continue to follow COVID-19 safety protocols at our branches and of our employees. 99% have got single dose and 92% have got both doses of vaccination. While several of our employees have been infected in the last couple of weeks, most of them are either asymptomatic or have mild symptoms with less than 1% of them being hospitalized. We have re-emphasized the COVID-19 protocols and launched a 24 by 7 dedicated helpline to facilitate physical and mental health counseling, RT-PCR testing, including isolation centers, as well as provision of hospital beds, oxygen support and ambulance. Work from home and isolation have once again become the norm and our systems as well as processes are fully geared for remote working. Wherever warranted, we have also practiced proactive isolation to ensure effective business continuity. In terms of the impact of the fresh surge in COVID-19 on mortality claims, the initial sense we are getting is that though there may be a sharp spike in infections, the result in mortality is not expected to be high, given the increased level of vaccination in the country and the reported nature of the symptoms of this new variant. We have covered the details of the impact of COVID-19 on mortality claims as well as the additional amount provided as of December 2021 later in the presentation. So before that, let me start by talking about a couple of developments during the quarter before moving on to our performance. I'm happy to inform you that during the quarter, we have won multiple awards across business functions. Our customer mobile app has won silver in the best mobile app of the year category in the Velocity Awards 2021. We also won ET BFSI Excellence in Innovation Award in the best use of emerging technology for business growth category for our humanoid, a voice bot for renewal premium reminder calling. Further, the League of American Communications Professionals LLC has awarded us with gold in 2021 Spotlight Awards for Excellence for our annual report of financial year 2021. We believe these awards are a testimony to our responsiveness to the environment, our ability to innovate, as well as meeting the expectations of our stakeholders, and these give us the confidence to set newer benchmarks as we move forward. As you may know, we started our ESG journey in financial year 2020 by enhancing disclosures on our practices and have been taking various steps to incorporate ESG principles in our day-to-day -day business activities. During the quarter, we have become a signatory to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, the first insurance company in India to do so. We are happy to note that our initiatives and progress on ESG front are now getting reflected in improvement in ESG ratings and scores given by some of the external agencies. Moving on to products, we enhanced our product suite further by adding two new products during the quarter. We launched an income plan, gift long term, which provides customers a guaranteed income for up to 30 years along with life cover. We also launched a term plan with return of premium. It has two innovative features. First, the insurance cover gets automatically adjusted based on the customer's life stage. Second, it provides financial cover against 64 critical illnesses, which is one of the most comprehensive and widest in the industry. I will now move on to our performance for the quarter. Our fourth piece strategic elements, that is premium growth, protection business growth, persistency improvement, and productivity enhancement, continue to guide us towards our objective 
of growing the absolute value of new business while ensuring that our customer is at the core of everything we do. And this, uh, as always, is uh, depicted in our slide four. I will talk through our performance on the fourth piece through slide five to 10 of our presentation and then conclude with a commentary on the VNB. Let me start with the first P of our strategic elements, which is premium growth. Our annualized premium equal uh, 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 APE grew by 16% to rupees 19.29 billion in Q3 of FI 2022, resulting in a 30% year-on-year growth for the nine months ended December 2021. Our total new business premium for the nine months ended December 2021 also grew by 30% year on year. Within this, our retail new business premium actually grew at a higher rate of 38% year on year. Our market share based on retail waiter receipt premium stood at 7.4% for the nine months of this fiscal as compared to 7.2% for the last fiscal. The strong growth in premium was driven by our diversified product mix as well as the distribution mix. For the nine months of this financial year, the contribution from link savings products stood at 50%, non-link savings at 29%, protection at 17%, and balance 4% from group savings. Within non-link saving products, if you can look at the chart, annuity was 4% of our total APE. On the distribution front, we continue to maintain a diversified distribution mix. In our nine month fiscal 2022 APE, the bank assurance channel share was 39%. Agency share was 24%. Direct business share was 13%. The share of other partnerships was 9%. And the balance was contributed by group business. Moving on to the second P of protection business on slide seven. First on retail protection. As you are aware, there has been a lot of discussion about the reinsurance price hike. In pricing the product to our customers, our approach has been to calibrate the pricing with the mortality outcomes using segmentation-based data analytics, recalibrate the underwriting standards based on emerging mortality experience across segments, review the retention limits based on our past outcomes, and preserve the overall VNB margin of the protection segment. As a result of this approach, we have been able to limit the increase in pricing at 0% to 10% across various segments without compromising on the VNB margin of the protection business. Given this marginal increase in prices, we do not expect it to have any material impact on the demand. Over the medium term to long term, given the significant underpenetration, we continue to believe it to be a multi-decade opportunity and specifically for a company like us, which has a strong customer proposition and a wide distribution network. Coming to this quarter's performance, despite the supply side constraints, we are happy to note that the decline in retail protection has been arrested sequentially when compared to the last quarter. Second, group term business. We continue to cater to the increased demand with a risk calibrated approach. We have significantly scaled up the business, primarily driven by increase in pricing. Given the push on vaccination by large employers like us, their willingness to financially cover larger base of their employees and the early evidence of low mortality claims from the third wave, we see this to be a great opportunity. This should also give us inroads into the retail protection business over a period of time. Third, credit life business. Similar to the group term, the pricing has already been revised for the credit life segment as well. Further, with pickup in credit demand and improved disbursement, we have seen a higher growth in this segment also. Given the performance of these three segments, our total protection APE grew by 20% to 3.06 billion rupees in the third quarter, resulting in 22% year-on-year growth for the nine months compared to the same period last year. Also, our protection mix has actually increased to 16.7% in nine months of this financial year, as compared to 16.2% in financial year 2021. I would like to highlight that based on total new business sum assured, our market share has actually increased to 12.7% in nine months of this fiscal from 12.5% in the whole of last financial year. With this, we continue to maintain the private market leadership in sum assured. 
Now, moving on to the third P of persistency presented in slide 8, we continue to see further improvements across most cohorts. While the 13-month persistency ratio has been stable at 84.8%, our 61st month persistency <coughs> ratio improved from 49.8 in March 2021 to 52.7% at December 2021. On the fourth P of productivity presented in slide 9, our total expenses grew by 25% year-on-year for the nine-month period of this financial year. The growth in expenses was lower than the new business growth, which stood at 30% for the same period. Alongside our 4P strategy framework, we continue to maintain a resilient balance sheet on mortality risk for nine months of this fiscal. Gross claims on account of COVID-19 stood at 20.45 billion rupees. And net of reinsurance, the claim amount was 9.82 billion rupees. This net claim amount includes settled as well as notified as well as in process claims. Further, at December 2021, we hold reserves of 2.03 billion rupees towards COVID-19 claims. Satyan will talk about this in more detail. Our solvency ratio was 202% as of December 2021 as compared to the required ratio, regulatory required ratio of 150%. On credit risk, only 0.2% of our fixed income portfolio is invested in bonds rated below AA and we continue to maintain a track record of not having a single NPA since inception. Of our total liabilities, non-par guaranteed return products comprise only about 1.6%. We continue to closely monitor our liquidity and ALM positions, and we have no issues to report. As a result of this above drivers, the BNB for nine months of this fiscal was 13.88 billion rupees, a significant growth of 35% over nine months of last financial year. Given our APE of 51.25 billion rupees, the resultant BNB margin was 27.1% or 9M FI 2022 as compared to 25.1 for the whole of last financial year. As we have always articulated in the past, we continue to focus on absolute BNB growth, which is our stated objective. Before I hand over to Satyam to talk us through some of the details, I would like to maintain that we continue to maintain our objective of doubling our financial, 2000, financial year 2019 VNB by financial year 2023, which requires a compounded annual growth rate of 28% over the current and the next financial years, as we have articulated earlier. With the VNB growth of 35% for this nine months of this fiscal year on a year-on-year -year basis, we believe that we are on track to achieve this aspiration. Thank you all for joining the call. I will now hand it over to Satyam. Thank you. Thank you, Kanan. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Our primary focus continues to be to grow the absolute value of new business. That is the VNB through the 4P strategy of premium growth, protection business growth, persistency improvement, and productivity improvement. The first element of premium growth, a product range with propositions to suit different risk characteristics of customers has been a very important enabler of premium growth. In terms of our performance on slide 15, we have registered a strong growth year on year across all segments except group funds business, which tends to be lumpy in nature. Within this, our annuity business grew by 77%, Linked business grew by 35%, non-linked savings grew by 29%, and protection grew by 22%, resulting in an overall APE growth of 30% year-on-year for the nine months ending December 2021. In terms of new business received premium for nine months FY22, annuity business contributions stood at 20%, significantly higher than 15% in the same period last year. With a premium amount of 12.21 billion in nine months FY2022, we were one of the largest pension and annuity providers in the market. Our wholly owned subsidiary, ICICI Prudential Pension Funds Management Company Limited, distributes products under the national pension system and is registered as a pension fund manager and a point of presence. 
this business is synergistic to our annuity offerings and is expected to support growth of the annuity business in future. The AUM managed by the PFM has increased by 58% over December 2020 to 104.41 billion at December 2021. The PFM has a market share of 15.6% in the private sector AUM at December 31st, 2021. Moving on to distribution, we have continued to enhance our distribution network across channels. In the agency channel, the approach has been to ring fence our highly productive agents. We also added about 18,000 new agents in nine months FY 2022. Within the bank assurance channel, we have a total of 23 bank partnerships. On partnership distribution, we added 72 partnerships during the nine months and now have about 700 partnerships across traditional and non-traditional distributors, such as web aggregators, payment banks, small finance banks, and insurance marketing firms. For the direct channel, the strategy has been that of upsell to our existing customers aided by analytics. Coming to the performance of these distribution channels on slide 18, we saw strong growth across distribution channels. A bank assurance channel APE grew by 21% year on year to 20.22 billion in 9M FI 2022. Specifically, the business share of ICICI Bank to overall APE was stable at about 28% for nine months FI 22 as it has been in the last two quarters. The annuity business from ICICI Bank grew by 78% year on year in nine months FI 2022. Our new bank partnerships continue to contribute to a significant share of bank assurance APE. Our agency channel APE grew by 32% year on year to 12.53 billion. Direct and partnership channels grew by 34 and 35% respectively in the same period over last year. The second element of protection growth on slide 20. Given the pandemic environment, supply side constraints, including revised underwriting guidelines, continue to impact the pure term retail protection business. One of our responses to these challenges has been a system integration with a document aggregator. With the customer's consent, this integration seamlessly fetches digital bank statements and income tax returns. For the month of December, when we started this, more than 1,300 applications were processed using this facility. Further, as Kanan mentioned earlier, we also launched a return of premium plan in the month of December 2021. This proposition allows us to cater to a newer customer segment. For nine months FI 2022, the overall protection APE grew by 22% to 8.56 billion. In terms of new business received premium, protection contributed 28% of the total new business premium for nine months FI 2022. With this, I would like to highlight that almost half of the new business premium for the period has been contributed by the protection and annuity segments, which are significantly underpenetrated parts of the market. The third element of persistency on slide 22. <clears throat> we continue to have a strong focus on improving the quality of business and customer retention, which is reflected in our persistency ratios. We have seen further improvement in persistency ratios across most cohorts during nine months FI 2022. Our 13th month persistency ratio at December 2021 was 84.8%. While this ratio is stable as compared to March 2021, it has significantly improved from 82.7% to 84.8% as compared to December 20. This makes us believe that directionally we should end the year with the 13th month persistency ratio being better than the full year last year. The fourth element of productivity on slide 25. <clears throat> on the cost side, the most significant increase has been in manpower cost. We continue to invest in our distribution expansion. Even with the cost increase, our cost to assets under management 
has been stable at 2.1% for nine months FY 2022. Also, we continued to leverage technology for process re-engineering and to drive productivity. Some of the key technology initiatives that we took during the quarter include an improved user interface and user experience in the mobile app providing simplified purchase as well as servicing experience. We also enhanced our app to include a fitness tracker for the customer. Empowered, we also empowered our partners to accept customer requests, including claim intimations on their platform. And as I had mentioned earlier in the context of simplification of protection onboarding journey, leveraging the ecosystem to obtain digital bank statements and income tax returns for financial underwriting has been a new initiative. In terms of digital capabilities too, we have got some significant achievements. Our website is the most visited website amongst the private sector life insurance companies. Similarly, our mobile app has been rated the highest within the life insurance industry. Over 90% of service transactions, that is roughly 3 million a month, are done through self-help or digital mode. In terms of insurance applications, the digital adoption rate is at 96%. The outcome of our focus on these four Ps, as you may see on slide 27, has resulted in a VNB of 13.88 billion for nine months FY22, a growth of 35% over nine months FY2021. Given our APE of 51.25 billion, the resultant VNB margin was 27.1% for 9M FY22 as compared to 25.1% in FY21. We continue to focus on absolute VNB growth, which is our stated objective. Now, moving on to the trend in COVID-19 claims. We continued to receive COVID-19 claims in Q3 FY22, but most of these were claims pertaining to previous periods, that is delayed intimations. COVID-19 claims pertaining to the current quarter have not been significant. As a result, our COVID-19 claims net of reinsurance stood at 9.82 billion for nine months FY22. Every claim that has been notified at any of our touch points is accounted for in this number, even as they are being processed further. Coming to the provision held for potential COVID-19 claims. There is a declining impact of COVID-19 claims that we have seen for Q3 FY22. Also, the emerging experience from other countries is that the mortality rate for the Omicron variant is significantly lower than the other earlier variants. Third, in India, the third wave hasn't peaked yet, and we still have a section of population that is yet to be vaccinated. We therefore believe that it is prudent to continue to hold provisions for future COVID-19 claims at December 2021. We now hold provisions of 2.03 billion towards potential COVID-19 claims. These include provisions for claims that have been incurred but not reported, as well as probable claims in the future based on the emerging trend. On the financial metrics, Profit after tax for nine months FY 2022 stood at 5.69 billion. Our solvency ratio was about 200 at 202.2% at the end of December 2021. Our AUM was more than 2.37 trillion rupees at 31st December 2021, a growth of 16% from December 2020. To summarize, we monitor ourselves on the 4P framework of premium growth, protection business growth, persistency improvement, and productivity improvement to improve expense ratios. Our performance on these dimensions is what we expect to feed into our VNB growth over time. Thank you, and we are now happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. 
If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Arav Sankai from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, hope all good at your end. So, uh, so my first question was pertaining to the growth that uh, we have seen in uh, quarter three. So, uh, I think uh, we have shown a little lesser growth compared to some of our private peers, uh, even though we kind of had a base impact. And uh, we have almost filled all the product gaps that we had with respect to, say, the non-par and uh, everything. So, how are we seeing the things pan out for, say, the next, uh, this quarter and specifically for the next year to, you know, to beat our, uh, our goal of VNB doubling? Like, what products might drive this growth and why were we a little lower than industry for this particular quarter, any reason and something of that sort? Yeah, Arav, uh, we are doing good. Uh, thank you for joining the call and ask the questions. I will ask, uh, you know, my colleague uh, <clears throat> Amit, uh, who is the CDO, to supplement uh, my answer. Uh, yes, uh, if you look at the quarterly growth rate, uh, we had uh, overall growth of about 15% uh, uh, on a year-on-year -year, uh, basis. Uh, so that is uh, probably what we are uh, what we are referring to. So, um, you know, the, they, we, we, the way we look at it is that rather than looking at a quarter-to-quarter -quarter number on the specific KPE or anything, uh, we would rather be focused on the uh, full year uh, BNB, which I talked about. Uh, the fact that we have already grown the uh, BNB at um, 35%, uh, there should not be any concern at all whatsoever in terms of our BNB development for the rest of this period as well as uh, for the uh, next financial year. So that is the way we would uh, plan it. Now coming to um, specifically uh, the channel side, uh, Satyan already talked about ICC Bank having uh, been stable between uh, 27 and 28% uh, during the last uh, few quarters. So that is the way uh, we would expect ICC Bank to continue. Uh, all the other areas have uh, actually grown at a much uh, higher rate. And, uh, you know, uh, depending on the uh, depending on the channel you look at, they have grown between 20% uh, to 30%. So um, we do have the momentum going for us. Uh, and uh, given the strategy changes in ICCI Bank, that has been uh, broadly stable at 27, 28. So that's the way we will look at the top line. Uh, but if you look at uh, the product side, uh, some of the uh, steps we have taken, uh, be it, uh, you know, the uh, protection product, or some of the long-term gift, uh, which is our non-linked uh, uh, saving solutions, they have really been uh, kicked in by uh, during the end of uh, December. So uh, full benefit of those uh, uh, initiatives we have taken on the product side uh, will play out in the last quarter. So we do have enough product levers available, and we do have the channel momentum going with us. And finally, I would also like to say that uh, the uh, bank partnerships which we have tied up, they are growing at a much faster rate compared to the company average. And uh, you know how uh, some of these banks close the fourth quarter. So we do believe that that also will give us a leg up um, in terms of the growth. And uh, the last point I want to talk about, though we have uh, talked about it in our opening remarks, is that on the retail protection also, uh, things, uh, you know, while it has been a year-on-year -year decline, uh, we have uh, got our act together in terms of our pricing strategy, which has led to only 0 to 10% increase in pricing, as we said. And with that out of the way, with the group term as well as credit life momentum going with us, even retail should come to our benefit. In fact, if I look at the quarterly margins and the nine-month margins, even with a little bit of slowness in the retail, we've been able to maintain and grow the margins compared to last year. Uh, not just because of uh, the other uh, lines of business in protection other than retail, but also because we've been carefully able to calibrate all our non-linked savings uh, products by uh, increasing, elongating the tenure as well as by increasing the annuity. So just to summarize, we have enough levers available on the product side as well as on the distribution side to have a good closure to this fourth quarter and ensure that we are on track regarding the VNB, absolute VNB growth objective. Uh, with this, I would like to hand it over to Amit uh, to see if he wants to add anything, any color on the distribution side. Amit, over to you. 
Yeah, Kanan, uh, I just want to extend uh, uh, the point that you made on a healthy growth that we have been able to witness outside ICSA channel. I just want to reiterate here. In terms of numbers, if you were to look at excluding ICSA, our growth actually has been in excess of 40%. As you know, that industry has grown at around 19.5%, and private insurers have grown close to 30%. So to that extent, excluding ICSA, uh, our growth has been quite commendable and in excess of 40%. So uh, in terms of ICSA recalibration of strategy, we have stated in the, uh, the previous quarters as well that they are very focused on driving bnb led products for us, which is principally uh, driven by annuity and protection ranger products. So they continue to do well on, protect, on uh, annuity, and their growth of almost 78% over last year is testimony to their commitment to annuity range of business. But as you know that <clears throat> in a weighted business, uh, annuity doesn't contribute to the top line. Same way, uh, while protection still remains one of the principal driver of ICSA, but the ecosystem challenges which were faced by the entire industry probably had an impact uh, on ICSA as well, which I'm sure as things pan out with the introduction of new products, ICSA will once again become a primary contributor uh, to our entire journey on protection side of business as well. So these are the things that I wanted to just talk to you about uh, about uh, uh, about channels perspective. On the products, you know that uh, what we, we today have our linked business almost being contributing close to 50% of our overall portfolio. And uh, and at times, you know, you will get upside of a good market sentiment, and there will be volatility in between times. Good part is that in comparison to how we used to run unit link business in the past, now we have any diversified uh, fund strategy also to support our unit growth, which was uh, further mm -hmm. supported by some of the new funds that we launched uh, in quarter, quarter three. So at times, some months, you may see uh, a good tailwind supporting unit link business, which is still a significant part of our overall portfolio. In a couple of months, because of volatility, you may see some migration uh, may happen from unit link to non-link savings business. But good part is that irrespective of the market volatility, you may see some migration here and there, but our, our comprehensiveness of our product suite uh, should take care of uh, uh, growth aspects, specifically in uh, channels which is out of the ICIC. These are the two points on product and channel front that I, I just wanted to support. Right. Uh, so thanks for the detailed answer, sir. So my second question is uh, around retail protection. So I think the industry has gone through a lot of consolidation in the past year, and uh, with all the price hikes and everything done, how are you thinking about retail protection, like with surety that this quarter we might see a pickup, or say for in the next quarter we might see a pickup? And uh, especially the second part I have in this question is regards to the ROP product that we have launched. So ROP is a very, uh, it's a very famous product, and people have demand for that uh, product. And there's one peers of ours which is very active in this segment. So how are we looking to compete in this segment and uh, what proportion of our overall protection do you think ROP can become given it is uh, a favorable product amidst the audience and whether that would affect our margin at the company level but since the uh, ticket size is also higher so VNV overall might uh, remain same but the margins might dilute a little. So any color on the ROP and the retail protection demand going ahead. Yeah, uh, Arav, uh, thanks for asking those questions. Karnan again. I will uh, give my uh, sense on uh, retail uh, uh, protection. Uh, how, where do we see it going from here? Uh, and then I will uh, request uh, uh, Amit to talk about some of the specific features of our ROV product, which we believe is quite a differentiated proposition in the market. I will also request Satyan to address your concern on uh, you know what kind of margin impact uh, which could be there and how we are planning uh, about it. Uh, the uh, first part on the retail protection, um, as you know, we have uh, seen a year on year decline in retail protection, which I talked about. Uh, the good news is that between uh, Q2 and Q3, we are broadly uh, stable in terms of the uh, retail protection. So that's the first point I want to talk about. The second point is that if I look at Q3, uh, from, um, let's say, uh, within that, while we give only the disclosures at the end of the year on what is the cons uh, constituent retail protection, I can tell you that between October to November to December, we have seen a sequential growth uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the uh, retail protection uh, growing. Uh, again, as I said, uh, we are looking at our BNB and the BNB margin with a lot of uh, 
uh, you know, positive uh, attitude because even with this kind of retail protection, we've been able to maintain the margins and grow our PNB. Uh, so growing from uh, going from here, what? Uh, since uh, this uh, stabilization has happened, we do believe that on a quarterly basis, at least we can improve the uh, retail protection from here on because uh, the increase in price has been marginal. And so we do not expect any material impact on demand uh, when it uh, uh, comes to uh, the price elasticity uh, perspective. So we don't see any problem. And of course, uh, the medium to longer term, uh, we see the demand growing every day. Or, I mean, absolutely the no dust of demand. Um, so that way, I would say that underpenetration opportunity, medium to long term opportunity is quite intact. Um, so what we have done, given all this, is that trying to take the momentum forward by keeping the price rises to a minimum, cutting out uh, completely undesirable profiles, focusing on profile, uh, um, you know, pro uh, desirable profile is how uh, we have uh, really calibrated this uh, business. So we are quite uh, confident of uh, uh, retail protection uh, growing. The only pinch of salt, if at all, I would like to uh, add is uh, about the, uh, the third uh, wave we talked about. We are seeing, uh, you know, prevalence of the uh, disease um, amongst uh, the employees as well as the distributors, and also I'm sure uh, from the customer's perspective also uh, the fulfillment, etc. So that we'll have to sort of a little bit calibrate, I feel. But I do see that more of a January issue here and now issue rather than even the February issue, given the severity of the disease and all the statements and the data which we are seeing, will probably be. Uh, you know, we'll have to watch that physical fulfillment issues on retail protection only for probably uh, January. So that is how we are planning the year and that is how we believe that things will uh, pan out from here. Now I would request Amit to talk about ROP product. Early days in terms of giving you a volume, too early, but I will ask him to give a sense of product features and how he expects to take. Uh, margin issue, we have uh, done a full analysis of margin issue because uh, after introduction of uh, ROP. That part I would request uh, Satyan to uh, elaborate. Thank you, Arun. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Kanan. So, so while we have uh, done our recalibration of pricing uh, post the changes that happened subsequent to reinsurer price hike, uh, to ring fence our best and most desired profiles in the affluent customer segment. Uh, that is something that Satyan will elaborate further. But specifically, how we have now gone about adding to the overall target segments is by introducing this return of premium product, which is appropriate for mass and mass affluent customer segment. And the insight that we were working on were twofold. One was that customer who wanted something in return and was not willing to invest on an expense towards covering his life and wanted something in return which was the most obvious insight that everybody was working on and there were markets, there were products which were available in the market you know, addressing that insight. So we have introduced a level cover product which, uh, which returns premium to the customer at the end of policy term. What we have done as an extension is given an option to the customer to convert his return of premium lump sum into an income form. So smartly product can be positioned as something which covers your life till you need cover and converts into an income once you need annuity. Similarly, there is another variant which is most appropriate for young urban where the need for protection may not be very high when he starts say at an age of 25 to 30, but his cover increases with his increase in liability, increase in loans that he undertakes over a period of time. So, the variant within this return of premium, also for specifically urban and young customers, it allows him to have a variable cover, which increases and decreases right through the life stage, and also give option to the customer to take his entire return of premium much earlier than the completion of policy term, which means that you actually get in hand your entire premium back when you are active and when you are healthy. So you can enjoy that return of premium and the lump sum payout and while your cover continues right till the policy term. So I think there's quite a few things that we have tried to do it differently in the return of premium variant. And I guess we will be able to go beyond what is most obvious uh, segment which has been addressed through return of premium products available in the industry today. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Satyan. Uh, 
Thanks. Over to you, Satya. Thanks, Amin. So from a margin point of view, Arav, you summarized it very well yourself when you said that actually in absolute VNP terms, it should not adversely impact, and that's how we look at it. What we had also said is that we would disclose the volume of business that we do in the ROP category separately. It was trivial in the last quarter, but it was still disclosed in the slide. Going forward as well, we will disclose it. The most important way, in which I mean, the way I would summarize what Kanan and uh, Amit also spoke about is that in the short term, given that we are not a one-trick pony anymore, but have multiple levers of growth and BNB expansion, one segment does not hurt us so much. Second, the longer-term prospects of retail protection indeed are our belief that over a period of time, this will grow to become a much larger opportunity than what it is even today. Third, the new product offerings, the way Amit described it and the way I would add to it is, by the way, it also offers a return of premium. So it's a richness of the features beyond return of premium, which is important. And four, from a VNB absolute point of view, given that it is an incremental market opportunity, we would like to believe that this is an incremental VNB opportunity and not a substitution from the retail protection. So one doesn't really have to worry about margins in that context. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Suresh Kanpati from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Uh, I know, uh, Kanan, I have two questions. One is, you know, you have just uh, shown a 0 to 10% hike. Is it that, um, I mean, that's what you're expecting on the protection side. Uh, is it that there is a greater amount of retention on your book uh, compared to what it is? We can share some numbers because we just wanted to know whether you are actually willing to take a higher risk so that the protection price hikes are limited. So uh, that's the first question. So, Suresh, yes, we have increased retention. The earlier retention in the protection was 2 million. We have taken it up to 10 million. Uh, the reason we have done it is that we believe that with the underwriting practices that we have put in place, with the risk selection procedures that we have put in place, and with the new price that we are offering, this will indeed be a profitable business which we can choose to retain with ourselves. And therefore, the main purpose of reinsurance now it's less about risk management, more about capital management. And whatever we do on retentions will be for the purpose of capital management and not, with, for, not for the purpose of risk management. So yes, we have increased it. After having been convinced ourselves that the proposition and the process that we are delivering is indeed continues to be as profitable as it was before. Okay, so earlier anything about 2 million was reinsured. Now everything about 10 million is reinsured, right? That is correct. Uh, so in terms of percentage, what would be? So if I were to really look at retail protection, would it be earlier 50% reinsured, now it be 70% reinsured in terms of the overall protection premiums, or how should I look at that number? So earlier it used to be almost 60 to 70% reinsured. Now it will come down to less than 50% being reinsured. Okay, but Satin, I'm not convinced on the risk aspect. The fact that the reinsurers were, I mean, suppose if there is going to be another big COVID wave, you are taking undue amount of risk on your book. How can you say that this is only a capital management issue? So Suresh, the, the whole point of the risk here is not just COVID. The fundamental part of risk here is about price commensurate with who we are selling it to. And that is where the underwriting norms and the target market come into play. If you heard what Amit described some time back, the way we have now repositioned our entire product suite is that the term life, which is the earlier product without return of premium, will be positioned more as a better demographic profile oriented product. The mass and mass affluent customer base to whom we were earlier selling some part of the term life, will now, we will now seek to migrate them so the term with return of premium, which has far more relaxed or liberal or higher expected mortality outcome priced into it. So we are now looking at operating in this spectrum of customers with a series of products, each of which from a mortality outcome point of view, we consider a suitable fit to the segment that we are offering. Particularly with respect to your question on COVID, 
will a higher retention increase exposure to single events it may very well increase exposure to single events but we believe that in the longer term the higher retention is commensurate with the outcome that we are expecting the product and in the shorter term whether it is a single event or otherwise we would much rather manage it from a risk management point of view through capital provision or catastrophic reinsurance to deal with non pandemic related single event so then sorry i'm going to hop on this a bit more because this is just uh, important we are for everybody in the call i mean the the challenge here is this is not going to stop here right so the reinsurance i expect further happen um, you know are, are, is the competition really tying your hands for you to really force yourself to take a decision because nothing was uh, nothing like this was hinted in the previous call suddenly you have decided to take a higher risk on your book so are the is the competition tying your hands therefore you have gone ahead and taken this decision and if there are subsequent further reinsurance hikes what is going to be your strategy are you going to keep retaining more because some point in time the price hikes have to be 25 30% if you can't retain so much on your books yeah first thing is the competition uh, uh, suresh uh, and then i will hand it over to satyan to talk about the future reinsurance approach etc uh, on the competition first i want to tell you that competition is not making us to do this at all because if you look at uh, even today if i keep out the return on premium if you look at a pure term life we are the market leader among the private players among in the, in the entire industry we are the market leaders on the uh, pure uh, retail uh, the issue of uh, the frictions on the ground in terms of uh, medical examinations underwriting standards etc has impacted everybody uh, all all of us together and even within that uh, we have been able to maintain our market leadership absolutely no problem on that so we will not be guided by what competitors are doing uh, in terms of our uh, pricing uh, strategy because last time around also when we thought that we should be uh, increasing the price higher than others we did it we didn't have any we didn't even uh, think about it a uh, couple of times so that is our approach so i want to assure you that it is not driven by competition at all it is totally driven by our own uh, data analytics on what has been our experience on that book of 1 crore and above and how we should be looking at it so with all the you know decision of the risk committee of the board and the board uh, we have taken this uh, call so i just want to assure you that it is nothing to do with the competition because if that is the case then even before we introduced all that we would not be showing a 27% margin at a growth of vnb of 35% for this uh, uh, nine months which is actually higher than our uh, targeted vnb growth so that i want to assure you i will like to hand it over to satyan to talk about our overall reinsurance approach satyan So this one of the things again that I have been harping on across the past almost now eight quarters is it matters less what reinsurance price is it matters more whether the mortality outcome is in line with pricing or not and I've said this repeatedly every time at the results call that view exactly remains the same and therefore from a reinsurance price point of view to the extent that I am reinsured. if there is a price change of course i will have to reflect it in the price to the customer but the most important part of this is to deliver an underlying mortality experience which is consistent with what we price for and with a higher retention we are basically standing up and saying that i have even more faith that my price will work for the underwriting norms that i have put in place. okay So Satyan, with long COVID and all these kind of issues, how can one be so confident about mortality experience, right? Are you appropriately pricing long COVID into your products and stuff? So just for us to get a bit more uh, clarity. Yeah. No, I, I totally uh, agree with your concern, uh, Suresh. But you know, I cannot be having a different underwriting standard for retaining in my book and different underwriting standard if I have to reinsure. It will come and bite me, and I will run out of capacity, or they will increase the price uh, so much in the next cycle to recover all the losses. so that has not been our approach at all i mean whether i do the risk management or the reinsurer does the risk management my underwriting standard has to be the same i cannot say that you know this somebody is going to backstop me because of that i can relax my underwriting standard that will come back and bite us that's not the way the industry itself operates and definitely we don't operate that way so it is just that based on a one crore portfolio in the past how the mortality has moved and we are getting the confidence that whether they do it or we do it doesn't matter i would rather retain the profit in that segment and then Uh, we will do uh, reinsurance as a capital management and finally the catastrophic cover also exists that is not going to really create a larger problem for the company 
So that, you know, I would request you to look at it from that perspective rather than saying that I will relax my standard if there is a reinsurance and then if I, I will, uh, you know, I, uh, that is not the way we can really build a portfolio. Satyam, you want to supplement anything? One last point, Kanan. I mean, all said and done, we have been talking about percentage price hikes. Suresh, but again, you have seen the comparison of prices. We are still not the cheapest in the market. So the pricing strategy still is not to be the cheapest product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I'm fine with this. Thank you so much, uh, Kandan and Sarkin. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Sir. Just, just one, just, just one thing. If I could add, also, uh, Sarkin, you may like to uh, clarify that that uh, we have segmented through deep analytics our entire target market for our own uh, pure term cover, and not only we are prioritizing some of our desired profiles. There are also some profiles that we have alienated in our strategy going forward, so which has improved our capacity to not only have the best pricing to our best customers, and also at the same time reduce risk because of eliminating some of the profiles in geography where we had the adverse profiles. So that's another something which helped us create capacity um, to keep our pricing uh, high limited. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Swarna Mukherjee from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, sir, a uh, couple of questions. Uh, first, again on the uh, retail protection side, I uh, wanted to understand that now uh, that you are pressing on this multiple levers of price hike and changing the underwriting things, so uh, does that imply that in, over time your supply side considerations would then uh, come down and your growth will be more volume driven as opposed to just the price driven growth that we expect to see because of the hike sir and and addition to that is in terms of again the rop product so uh, i got a little bit confused in terms of the strategy uh, because if you are planning to uh, sell it to the mass and mass segment customer segment uh, where you also sell the individual your product then uh, how would you uh, be you know seeing this as an incremental gmb opportunity so if you could throw some color on that and then which channels would address that so would this be again sold by icci bank largely or across channels so this is my first question so maybe i'll first talk about the the uh, supply side constraints so fundamentally, what we are seeing is supply side constraints, uh, Swarnam, are driven by some of the pandemic-related situations. So as long as the pandemic is live, some of them may very well continue to be there. Only once the pandemic subsides and the environment improves, will some of these become uh, tailwinds, if you will, from a growth point of view. And therefore, in this context, what is more important is not to go after unbridled growth in volume, but to ensure that what we write is written on terms that we are comfortable with for the 30 or 40 years that we'll be retaining the risk on our books. Going forward beyond the pandemic period, of course, we would expect the volume-driven growth to be the big driver. That is also our entire thesis with respect to the opportunity, where at the current point of time, our estimation is just about 10% of the addressable population for term life actually has term life cover. So yes, indeed, over a medium to long term, it will be a volume-driven business. But in the short term, there are multiple levers that we will have to operate on to ensure that we write the business in a sensible fashion. To your question on, is there a confusion on the positioning of the product? We would like to think not. Because fundamentally, if I were to look at myself or yourself as a consumer, typically the more affluent people will not see value in a return of premium proposition. They would much rather go for a product which may not return premium but provides a higher cover, which is what they are looking at. But typically, the more mass and mass affluent customers are the people who express a view to say that, look, I don't have money to spend on insurance. At least what I can do is to convert part of that into savings, but still get sizable insurance cover. And that is the customer need which is driving into the return of premium variant. But more importantly, like Amit described earlier in the conversation, this is not just a return of premium product. 
it is actually a product with a host of innovative features, which also has a return of premium feature. So to that extent, given the customer segment who typically prefer a pure term and who typically prefer a return of premium, you can see it in the industry data already is burned up today. The average sum assured of people writing pure term is 70 to 80 lakhs. The average sum assured of people that are selling term with return of premium is probably closer to 25 lakhs. So it's a very different customer segment which clearly is being established even by the current people who are selling the product. And that's the reason why we believe it will be an incremental opportunity. Okay. Okay, that's very helpful. Sir. Uh, so my second question is on the uh, reserve side uh, for uh, basically the COVID-19 uh, claims. So uh, uh, you at the end of this quarter had 2.03 billion uh, in terms of uh, provisions, while uh, at the end of the last quarter it was at 4.12 billion. So uh, would you kindly uh, uh, tell us how the flow has been uh, in this? Because I just wanted to know if there has been a reserve release because I can see that the incremental claim has been uh, 1.2 billion uh, net of reinsurance between Q2 and Q3. So if you could explain the flow in the provision. Yes, there has been a release of reserves. So I will talk through the numbers. And when we spoke of the numbers last quarter, the way we typically tag claims as potentially COVID is based on what submission the customer has made. Eventually, when we assess the claim, then we do the final classification of what is COVID versus COVID. So in a way, there's a bit of redoing of the past numbers as well. So I'll talk through some of the numbers. During this quarter, of the intimations that came to us in the quarter, claims on account of COVID net of reinsurance was 0.7 billion. Out of this 0.7 billion, a bulk of it, which is 0.65 billion, pertained to debts which had happened prior to October 1, which means Q1 and Q2. Like you mentioned, at the end of the last quarter, we had an IBNR provision of 1.13 billion, out of which we ended up utilizing roughly 0.65. So to that extent, our provision at the end of the last quarter was still more than sufficient to cover what intimations we got with delays during the last quarter. We closed the year with an IBNR provision of 0.24 billion. So net net, there was some release net of claims that we saw during the quarter. On the claims, on the provisions for future COVID claims, we had a provision of almost 3 billion at the end of last quarter. During the quarter, we only got about 0 0.05 billion worth of claims in that context. As against a claims intimated of 0 0.05, which were not accounted in the last uh, quarter end, Against that, we continue to hold a provision of almost 1.8 billion. So net net, when I put all of this together, I indeed have a provision release net of claims that I booked in the quarter of roughly 2 billion rupees. In the financial statement, I do have a net provision release of about 2 billion. But when I look at the balance sheet provision, a further 1.8 billion of COVID plus uh, 0.24 billion of uh, IBNR, which is the 2 billion plus that we spoke about, is still in the context of only 0 0.05 billion of intimated claims that we had in the last quarter. So we still think that that is a fairly prudent level of provision to carry as we go into the last quarter. Right, sir. That, that's very clear. Thank you. And if I may uh, squeeze in uh, one further question sir. on the non-linked savings side. Uh, so uh, this quarter has been slightly slower on this side. Now uh, that a new product has come with uh, uh, very competitive IRR, uh, your thoughts on uh, how do you see it standing out uh, and which channels you want to utilize considering that your larger partner is not selling traditional products? Amit, you want to talk about uh, the new uh, new uh, product, the new IRR? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, thanks, Kamil. So we have re introduced this uh, uh, guaranteed product in the long-term income space. 
uh, as you know that uh, guaranteed space is segmented into three type of customer benefits uh, one is lump sum where a customer pays for a specific period and then gets a lump sum after the policy term then there are short term income which is 5 year 7 year 10 year kind of a time frame for which over which customer gets guaranteed income and then there was a large market which was catering to long term guaranteed income requirement of the customer that is the space where we have introduced this new product uh, with few additional features and that is something which is a very recent phenomena you are right that uh, that one of that our larger partner our bank insurance partner is not selling traditional products nevertheless uh, we believe in customer proposition and going by what we saw as early demand from some of our other distribution channels we found it worthwhile to complete our offering if you recollect uh, we uh, we launched our guaranteed products over a period of last 15 months in a graded manner and we built ability over a period of last 12 to 15 months to keep adding to our uh, guaranteed product proposition so, so we want to watch it closely it has been taken up well this is a space and demand which is already existing it will be competitive pricing uh, at some point in time it, it it goes through a recalibration almost every month there are committees in various insurance companies who take stock on pricing it is as you know it is also linked to uh, overall policy rates and government yields as well so it is it is a dynamic world and at times you may look like competitive at times you may not but this is something that we'll take it which is part of this product design that you will go and see it closely but we are happy uh, with almost 70% like uh, what karan mentioned almost 72% of our business is now outside icici so no longer uh, one can say that a uh, large part of our distribution is not contributing so we still have 72% of our distribution which is non icici and uh, and we are very happy to take care of a product design which exclusively suits uh, this remaining part of our non icici distribution yeah if uh, your question was specifically about here and now uh, january and q4 i i would expect it to be taken up by the corporate agents broker shops and non icici multi partner shop multi partner banks so that is uh, where i would see some momentum coming through uh, during this quarter okay sir. yeah, so, yeah. So just one thing one thing just i want to add contrary to belief that uh, a, a mass and mass affluent customers uh, tend to prefer guaranteed range of products but actually you know in case of a market volatility we have seen quite a few of affluent customers looking at guaranteed product as part of their asset diversification strategy so even when the markets were doing well we did not see customers going away from their asset diversification in which they were making a choice on guaranteed range of products and that is a trend which we are continuing to see markets have gone up and down a couple of times in last quarter as well but the demand for guaranteed uh, space suggests that it is going to stay and it was not temporarily only linked to a market volatility i guess it is a good diversification tool even for affluent customers so we expect this trend to continue in jantar march as well Sure, sir. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, actually, more questions. I will join back in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Adarsh Par Paras Rampuriya from CLSA. Please go ahead. Hi, um, Mr. Kanam. Um, so, question uh, going back to reinsurance. Uh, if the threshold moves from two million to ten million. Um, the reinsurance levels could drop a lot more than that. Less than 50, right? It could be a much more significant drop if you could just because I believe uh, your average retail term insurance protection tickets were like seven eight million. So uh, you know, correct me if it's wrong. Your the uh, retentions could fall quite quite a lot more than closer to being 50. It could, Adesh. But what I'm looking at is. with the change in our approach to underwriting and price we have to see what proportion of our business comes above 1 crore with a new product launch which is tuned more at the mass mass affluent which is expected to take us some of the smaller sum assured that we were selling in the retail protection we have to see how much of it moves into that segment that product carries a retention of 4 million 
the pure term has a retention of 10 million the term with return of premium has a retention of 4 million so the reason i'm putting it somewhere in between is that there are too many moving parts right now we have to see where the mix gravitates before we are able to definitively conclude but you are right uh, it could even end up being more being retained with us Sorry to interrupt. May I request Mr. Adarsh to please rejoin the queue? We have participants reading for the turn. Yeah, I'll just complete this question. So, Satin, just just continuing on the same question is um, the uh, you know the way to look at it is this could be an industry level phenomena, correct? And uh, you know it's it's broadly not a choice you have, right? It's 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 what reinsurers really would have wanted more skin in the game. Uh, you know, broadly, is that the way to look or approaches are going to be dramatically different across uh, insurance players, sir? Oh, they can be quite different, Adesh. Uh, the, what you said is correct. It is indeed the expectation of reinsurers that insurers should retain more. But I don't think any reinsurer is asking for retention to go up from 2 million to 10 million. And therefore, that is a choice that individual companies, depending on the strength of their balance sheet, depending on the capital position and depending on their own comfort on the price and underwriting, will have to make a decision individually. So you could end up with a range of practices across the industry at the, uh, after the change of reinsurance rates. And, and this means, right, when you take the threshold so high as a, you make a choice, you're almost saying that I am uh, I'm quite comfortable with my pricing now, so there should not be need for more protection rate hikes for the category that you want to underwrite over the next two three years. Because that if it true. requires a hike, then it it it, it means that uh, you lose money somewhere, right? So absolutely, you're right. That is a fair inference to make. It does require high conviction, which we have others. Yeah, sorry, I'll go back to the queue, but I think the only important element here is that uh, when you when you cut across the categories, while I agree with the long term, it's about, uh, you know, how much tightening that the systems had on underwriting so that the volume recovers and when it recovers. That's the only thing. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a fair uh, point to make, Adesh, which is why, I like I said before, the approach is no longer restricted to one product with one underwriting model. The approach is now spread across two products with differential underwriting norms depending on the segment of customers that we are uh, that we are offering it to to ensure that at the end of the day, each of these segments delivers an outcome of mortality which is consistent with the price that we are charging for them. Therefore, to that extent, the extension of the offering through the new product that we have made, which, like I said, has higher expected mortality assumptions, actually widens the market for us. Sorry to interrupt. May I request Mr. Adarsh to please rejoin the queue, sir? Yeah, yeah I'm done. Sorry about uh, putting Thank in you. a question. Thanks. No problem. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is, is able to address questions from all participants, Request you to please limit your question to one per participant. If you have a follow-up question, you may rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of Sanket Goda from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, Sachin, we, we at, at peak levels, we did almost retail protection business of 780, 770 odd crores in FI20. So if, if the numbers go back to those levels and, and we largely retain the sum assurance on that kind of a business on our books, so, so assuming that numbers come back and we retain large part, then, then likely impact on the solvency, which, which is around 202 percentage right now. So, so, so this is wondering, given given the strain it has and, and, and new business strain it has and then also the capital consumption goes up, uh, do, uh, the, uh, what likely impact uh, would be there on solvency because of uh, the quantum of business if we do in say 22 or 23, uh, 23 rather I would say. So we'll watch it as it comes, Sanjay. The point that you make is indeed correct. Higher retention will mean a higher capital consumption. So our own expectation, our own expectation at this point of time is when we are projecting into FI23, 
we still see ourselves as being uh, comfortably capitalized. Beyond FY23, what is the utilization of capital we will have to monitor? But the point really being that if a strategy of retention helps us retain more profit within the company at a risk that the balance sheet is able to take, then that is something which is worth deploying capital for. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deepika Mundra from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, is it just on the uh, 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 distribution mix? Uh, can you tell us what was the non uh, ITCF and Kartner mix uh, during the quarter? Uh, and also, um, the willingness of uh, ITCF banks to sell ROP products along with your term and annual. Yeah, on the first question, uh, you know, we, we've already said that ICCF bank has been doing between 27 and 28. Uh, so that has been the number uh, for the ICCI bank. Uh, the overall uh, bank assurances uh, between 39 and 40 actually. So you can conclude that the non ICCI bank would be about 12% uh, uh, of the mix. Uh, so that is uh, broadly the numbers uh, for the non bank, which has started becoming very significant. Non ICCI bank number uh, for other banks has also started becoming significant now. On the second issue of uh, ICC Bank uh, selling ROP, definitely yes. Uh, I would request uh, Amit uh, to to just supplement if anything else you want to say about uh, ICC Bank taking up ROP. Amit, go ahead. Yeah, so, so absolutely, Kanan. Uh, uh, ICC Bank uh, in its uh, stated strategy will continue uh, to look at variants across protection category of products. Uh, to take care of uh, the requirements across their customer segments, uh, which is both value banking, which they call it as mass and mass affluent customers, uh, privileged banking customers, as well as wealth customers. It is very much in line uh, to be launched with ICC Bank as well. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avina Singh from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, good evening. Uh, quick question uh, uh, or two. One, if you can provide some color on, uh, you know, for the nine month retail protection policy count or uh, trend growth and the ticket size change. Uh, and on the G, uh, your retention again, uh, so have you changed your retention policy on GTI and credit life? And uh, in the backdrop of GTI seeing a meaningful price increase in the last two quarters, and so far, I mean, COVID, uh, uh, I mean, being benign in the last two quarters. Do you see your GTI profitability for this year could, I mean, surprise positively? Thanks. Uh, so from a GTI point of view, yes, we will see how the experience emerges. We have built in certain elements of pricing for expected COVID. To the extent that actual claims are different from that, we will keep recalibrating our pricing because you don't want to be in a situation where you're not adding value to a customer. So that is something that we will track. So if indeed claims are lower, then it may be a positive surprise at the end of the year with respect to profitability of that portfolio. Uh, in answer to your question on retention strategy, right now our retention strategy increase is for retail protection. It is possible at some point of time in the future that we consider extending it to the other segments of protection as well. But for now, it is only on the retail protection. In answer to your question on the number of policies on retail protection, that's not something that we have disclosed publicly separately, Avinash. We'll have to wait till the end of the year when we give the full breakup of all of these segments to give that color. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so my question is just so that I understood correctly. So going forward, our focus will be more on the ROP product in term life. So what kind of uh, mix should one expect for, let's say, for 22 and 23, the split between ROP kind of product and term life I mean, and pure term product? Secondly, in pure term product, how, how are we going to protect our margin and that their retention could be higher because of higher sum assured? And that might mean that uh, the reinsurance price hikes will be flowing through more than that product. So, uh, Abhishek, uh, ROP, uh, 
I don't think we said that we are shifting our strategy to RO. All I'm saying is we have added another product, another proposition, another offering to our arsenal, which helps us to expand the target market. Now, quite honestly, where the mix will settle down is uncertain because there are a number of new segments that we are trying to create with the product that we have launched. So we will wait to see at least one full quarter, which is this quarter, to understand where the mix of that is settling down. With respect to the question on the reinsurance price hike, if I'm retaining more, effectively the reinsurance price hike has a lesser, lesser pass-through effect to customers. And therefore, to that extent, by retaining more, I'm actually saying that uh, I'm, I'm less exposed from an end customer price point of view and an end profitability point of view to future changes in reinsurance price hike. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Madhukar Ladda from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Um, hi, thank you for taking my question. Most of my questions have been answered. I just wanted to get a clarification on the COVID hit number for uh, this quarter. So, uh, so I, I believe you said that there's a co uh, there's a reserve release. Of about uh, two billion, uh, but if we look at the uh, net claims uh, post reinsurance, they are at about nine point eight billion. And if I were to add that number for the first two quarters, uh, that would be at about uh, eight point. Six billion. So there's there's about a additional 1.2 billion charge for this quarter. Uh, have I missed anything or? Uh... No, no, you haven't missed anything. Like I said earlier on, Madhukar, when we talk about claim amount on account of COVID, initially we do it based on the information submitted by the customer as part of a claim. Subsequently, when we complete the assessment of the claim then we may very well find that something which was represented as a COVID claim may not be, or which was not represented as a COVID claim may actually be. Therefore, to that extent, for the past period, there is a bit of reclassification which happened. So overall, if I were to see YTD minus YTD, you're right, the number looks more like 1.1 billion. But for the quarter purely of claims that got intimated to us, only 0.7 billion was uh, recorded as claims on account of COVID. So the, the reason I use that number is to illustrate very clearly that the pattern of claims on account of COVID has come down very sharply in Q3 compared to the prior period. So yes, there is a little bit of reclassification back to the earlier period as we have completed the claims assessment. Understood. Got it. Both so this, you know, your number you would be driving, uh, uh, deriving around 1.2 as against uh, 0 0.7, right? Right. Yeah. So both are uh, right in their own way. So if you just map back the date of death, which is the information for which was obtained subsequently. Understood, sir. Uh, thank you and all the best, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manish Shukla from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Satyam, just a clarification going back to reinsurance. You said that at INR 2 million, that covered 60 to 70 percent of your portfolio. Uh, given your customer positioning and ticket size, I would have expected that number to be significantly higher, the proportion. No, no. We were reinsuring 60 to 70 percent, Manish. No, so at anything more than INR 2 million was automatically reinsured or it was discretionary? It was automatically, no, no, it was automatically reinsured. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, right? So your ticket size and customer segment uh, in which you've been operating till date before ROP, I would have expected a much larger proportion of your policies to qualify at INR 2 million plus. No, we had we had an average uh, sum assured of about 7 million or so, between 6 and 7 million. So given the 7 million average with a retention of 2 million, give or take, it is a one-third retention in that sense. So between 30 to 40% is what I was retaining. 
the rest was reinsured. I'm using broadly rough numbers. Okay, I understood. Yeah, fair point. Fine, I got it. And where, uh, the change of threshold was effective what date in terms of retention? Two to five, uh, ten million. December, last week of December. Last week of okay, December. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harshad Toshniwal from PMG Invest. Please go ahead. Hi, Satya. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So uh, the question is with respect to our uh, uh, targets of doubling the VMD by 23. So, I mean, if I just look at the ask rate uh, standing today, uh, then even if we kind of maintain a stable margins, uh, we would be looking for a uh, 15 to 20%, around 20% uh, uh, top line growth in 23. Now, uh, just want to understand that uh, uh, again, uh, when we look at the recent month numbers in November, December, uh, our YOY growth rates have started moderating to a 10%, 15% levels. But uh, just want to understand the confidence levels for achieving a 15, 20% growth on a last year's base, uh, uh, on basically on FI22 base. Uh, how how do you look at that target? I agree that uh, we, we clearly have an aspirational target on VNB, but I think uh, VNB margins is something which uh, we would uh, expect to be stable over there, but uh, clocking a 90 billion kind of uh, APE in FI23, how do you achieve that 90 or rather 100 billion uh, AP? How should we look at that number? Uh, sure. So uh, maybe I'll start off and then hand over to Amit to explain. I think fundamentally what we are looking at is multiple channels contributing to the growth. If you see all of the channels that we have been building out during this year, whether it is agency, mm -hmm. whether it is new bank partnerships, whether it is non-bank partnerships, all of them, and like Amit mentioned this in answer to an earlier question, collectively have been growing in excess of 40% this year. And particularly even in the third quarter, they have been growing closer to the 20% number that you spoke about. So 15 to 20% in the context of the build out that we are putting on these channels to us seems reasonable. Amit, do you want to add? Yeah, just on two elements, uh, uh, two elements I wanted to just add uh, Satyan over to what you're talking. See, uh, first of all, this year has been, the large part of this year, almost nine months has been quite muted on protection line of business, in introduction of new products, and what we have now uh, opened a new segment through ROP. Uh, one, we will, of course, have a play for entire 12 month period next year. That is one. Couple of more inter interventions that we did, even on non link savings business, uh, which was addressing almost uh, 40 45% of the overall guaranteed space, which we have now opened for us, uh, which was applicable only for three, four months in this year will actually be available to us for entire 12 month period. That's the second one. Third is by organic nature of some of our distribution channels, like for instance, partnership distribution, we add 50 to 100 partners every year. And that is what we have seen both through organic, which is efficiency led growth, and also through inorganic addition of partners, we have been consistently growing in excess of 30% in the entire distribution space of partnership distribution. Uh, that is something which uh, gives us confidence. And other than banks, if you ask me, uh, we still believe that at the current penetration levels which exist in our existing banker partners and with completeness of the product profile that we have added over a period of time, I guess this is only the first full 12 month period that we have experienced with our new partners. And they will, of course, organically, we expect them to grow further from where they are currently. We have seen some of our partners actually experiencing growth in, in excess of 40%, where the entire growth has been contributed only because of partnership with us. So their existing incumbent partner has been able to stay at a similar level or a single digit growth, but their large part of growth has been contributed by us. And they are all uh, fee hungry, uh, distribution uh, channels and we do believe that their fee aspirations will only grow from their current levels 
and we will uh, we will be the beneficiaries in terms of growing uh, through our partnerships uh, further in next financial year over what we have delivered this year. Got it. Got it. The reason I just asked to ensure that any uh, going forward is going to be the AP growth, which will be the key driver for us to track uh, in terms of the achievement of that uh, 2x VNB. Again, so like I said, it will be a mix of it. It will be a mix of both, like I just mentioned, because protection, uh, the annuity range of products, as well as what I mentioned about non-link savings guaranteed products. These were the introductions towards the latter part of the year this year, which will be available for entire 12 month period, which may contribute towards margin expansion as well. So it will be a combination. How it pans out starting next year, we'll we'll see. But of course, large part of it will be AP driven, but uh, margin expansion is also not ruled out. Got it. Yeah, sorry, Satyan. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I think that, that's the same thing, Amit. Thanks. Thanks, Amit. Thanks, Satyan. All the rest. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nidhajan from Investec. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so, firstly, on the long term guaranteed products, uh, we have been staying away from those products uh, uh, in the past. So what makes us uh, confident to launch these products in this, in this quarter from a hedging perspective? Yeah, just two aspects, uh, we, we, we said that uh, two aspects of this business can make it uh, uh, bad. One is that uh, assuming a large level of laxation and assuming that guarantee will be paid for by the laxation. So that approach continues. Um, so to that extent, uh, we are uh, uh, not factoring in laxation and all that. We are just uh, mindful of... Uh, uh, the elapsation being higher, still having to deliver. So that one boundary is something which we are taking the actual uh, persistency experience in our uh, uh, past uh, non-linked savings products. Uh, the second is clearly that uh, we have uh, uh, talked about um, the market instruments uh, and derivatives being available. Uh, and that to the extent it can be manufactured well, uh, we will be able to execute this product. That has been our approach. Uh, uh, for that. So we are getting more instruments are available, more counterparties are coming today. We never believed in internal hedging and all that, so we never wanted to do that. That was the second point of objection to uh, uh, launching this product in a big way. So here also if you look at it, premium payment term is up to 10 years only. And each class of new business will be uh, designing a hedging program. And, and the market seems to be quite liquid today. And uh, we have uh, locked in the yields for the future premium. And of course, uh, we look at the underlying bonds for derivatives selected, keeping in mind the liability tenure. So those uh, uh, instruments are available today. So, and we do believe that uh, this is something which can be executed without taking too much risk. Uh, that's why we are getting uh, more confident today than in the past uh, launching and uh, selling uh, these products. Of course, we will uh, we will review pricing based on the interest rate environment. That uh, that may not be applicable for the tranches already sold, but the future we will keep calibrating it to so make sure that uh, we are uh, quite on on track for that. Uh, I can think on the on the reinsurance strategy. Just uh, thinking about it, it doesn't uh, look uh, very very obvious because we keep on hearing that the reinsurers have been making losses even before COVID. Uh, they were making losses on this portfolio, uh, and now we are increasing our retention rate uh, quite significantly. Uh, so we are hinting that we on our portfolio reinsurers were making profit, and uh, uh, and and we believe that uh, on uh, and we, we want to make, make that profit on, on our own rather than give it, passing on that benefit to reinsurers. Is, is the way that we are hinting? Not really, Nidesh. I would hesitate to say that. All I'm saying is, and this is something that Sanan spoke about earlier, and Amit also repeated. The way we looked at our experience of the portfolio. We broke it up into segments of where we were getting favorable experience and where we were not getting favorable experience. And we also looked at what, so what we were also looking at is what was the proportion of business which was giving us the less favorable experience. So all that we have done is to cut the tail on those segments of business which were giving us more claims so that we could bring the experience back in line with the price. Like I've said before, whether it is my price or the reinsurer's price is less relevant. What is more important is how do we bring experience to line with price. And that's the reason why the offering that we are now making of the old term without return of premium product 
is going to be slightly different from who I was offering it to. So there are some segments that I'm letting consciously to ensure that claims are within the limit. So I'm not saying that reinsurers have not made a loss because of me, but I'm saying that I've got enough data from segments in the past to give me comfort that for those segments, I can write it, underwrite it in a profitable fashion. Uh, yeah, in that context, uh, uh, please rejoin the queue, sir. Sure, sure, okay. Let me just finish this uh, question. I think he's uh, asking a supplement question at the same point. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, in that context, uh, doesn't it make a uh, logical sense that uh, pure protection, uh, except uh, 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 out of uh, outside of ROP, will see uh, will not see a very meaningful growth even next year because uh, we will cut down uh, some segments which were not uh, profitable in the past. So that's the interesting part of innovation. The size of the tail that was contributing to the core experience is actually not very large. So the loss of business because of cutting it is really not something we would worry about in the context of the opportunity. All that we have to do is to make sure that we are disciplined about not taking on those loans. So I don't think that this will affect the growth prospects we are not in that way restricting the target market to say half of what it was before. That's not what we are doing. We are cutting the tail. It's a small tail in volume, but a thick tail in terms of experience. So that, that is the analysis we had really made uh, before we went to the board committee. To look at, I mean, this is a natural question by any board saying that if you cut that ticket, how much of business hit you are going to take? So that was really uh, something which is uh, some, a very manageable bias. And just look at the base, uh, you know, today of retail protection. So we do believe that from here on it can only be uh, one way, which is the way up. So those are the couple of, uh, you know, analysis which we did. We are very confident. And also, you know, one area which probably we don't focus a lot on is that even we talked about retail protection and so on. We have uh, backfilled it quite uh, well uh, through the credit life and uh, group uh, term business, which has really helped us during this period even as our uh, uh, retail uh, was still uh, struggling on a year-on-year -year degrowth because of various reasons, we have been able to manage uh, the overall protection uh, growth of 22% through that. I think that is something which probably we don't spend so much time. We get all of us sort of focused so much on uh, retail protection and the price increase that uh, we have been able to work on the other areas uh, to significantly bring the overall uh, or, or at least mitigate the risk arising out of uh, uh, low volumes in retail protection. Another area what we have done is really, if you really look at the non-protection uh, businesses um, it, and the non-linked uh, products, there uh, we have been able to work a lot in terms of uh, enhancing the margins by, uh, you know, elongating the tenures and so on. I think today uh, the confidence we have uh, in our margin or the overall uh, VNB story is that we have multiple levers uh, available. So, uh, I, and also in some of the cases, we have done increase the attachment of riders. So, while yes, uh, we were uh, talking a lot in the public about uh, retail protection because that is uh, retail protection and the price increase because that is the flavor of the day, we worked systematically on various aspects of our business, non-link, how to increase the margins, how to bring in attachments of riders to increase, in protection, how do we increase our uh, pricing in uh, retail, uh, sorry, in uh, group uh, credit life how to increase the pricing in the group term and still get the volumes up. I think those are, you know, five, six things which uh, we don't uh, discuss much uh, because uh, the discourse got too much carried away uh, by retail protection during this period. So today I would say, you know, to again, uh, to, to summarize, the kind of levers which are available to us, both from channel perspective and the product perspective, to aid our growth aspiration on VND, is much more, much more than this today compared to what was there three years back. That that assurance I want to give you all. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ajok Fedrix for Missile Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Sir, uh, as long as I have known, I have known I say potential, sir cautious and a conservative firm because be it non-fire, we took our time to come in, be it long-term uh, products, we took our time. Price high competition, we started completely last year. But right now I'm seeing a pretty aggressive stance across board, uh, be it IRR rates or uh, protection 
retention rates. So what is giving us uh, this shift in uh, stance? Uh, if you can touch upon uh, your capability increase or uh, the document aggregate that you're talking about. So uh, apart from the usual topics that you have already discussed, what else are we giving us the conference? Yeah, so first question, I would say that our approach of being cautious and especially when uh, when it comes to risk management hasn't changed at all. That I want to assure you that suddenly it's not that we have become aggressive and then doing various things. Yeah. Uh, I will request uh, Satyan to talk about the uh, issue around the um, logic for retention, but I would like to say the IRR rate, which we talked about, is uh, based on full coverage of uh, our uh, ability to execute this rate based on the cash instrument plus derivative. So what we do is that uh, uh, every, um, every uh, quarter we go to the board and we tell them that what is the rate which we are uh, able to execute with the cash plus derivative on the book which is being sold in that particular month versus what is what we promised to the um, uh, uh, customers. Uh, without that, we don't do that business. And you can have seen the um, rate going up uh, and we have seen uh, uh, certain movements in the financial uh, markets. Because of that, we have been able to pass the rate. Even now, we may not be extremely competitive when it comes to our uh, IRR of competitors, but uh, so be it. That is our approach towards uh, what IRR we want to promise in the non-linked business. Coming to retention again, uh, the approach we have taken is that in a particular portfolio, which is greater than one crore, if the, the experience is so good that we don't require reinsurance, why part the uh, the uh, the, uh, the um, profits with the reinsurer? Reinsurers are required for an area which is like a catastrophe where there is a lot of uh, uh, you know the, the the loss given default is very high, or in in an area where uh, you know we require their uh, uh, presence because we are not yet sure of the full uh, uh, emergence of mortality. Those are the two situations where we require their presence much more. So what we have done is that, as Satyan mentioned earlier, uh, a certain percentage of business we have cut out because the mortality experience was adverse. So to that extent, it didn't, it didn't entail any cross subsidization with other businesses or increasing the um, you know pricing in the other segments. That is one part we have done. Another part we have done is that we looked at the one crore above portfolio. We are very happy with retaining it because of the kind of mortality emergence which has been there in the portfolio in the past. And that is the basis uh, on which we have done. So any such move will continue to be guided by our framework of being cautious and at the same time ensuring uh, that uh, you know we take the market realities into account and ensure that we do it in a sensible manner. Satyan, you want to just um, you know elaborate anything on IRR uh, setting? as well as the uh, retention uh, philosophy beyond what I mentioned. Thank you. Uh, so, Kanan, I was off the call for a bit, so I didn't pick up all of it. Uh, Satyan, uh, if you can touch upon uh, the technology piece a bit, uh, because you guys have uh, uh, really, uh, I mean, uh, showcased your ability there. And uh, I'm assuming that that is also helping you when pricing that is in a much better fashion. So some color on that document aggregator or is, is that helping you a lot So, on, on that side of it? Yeah, so I will have uh, Satyan supplement, but essentially the way we looked at uh, during this uh, phase uh, is uh, are two things. One, we have some kind of friction on the ground to do the fulfillment because of the pandemic uh, uh, triggered environment. On the other side, we are seeing a huge uh, you know, transformation when it comes to payment and financial ecosystem. You've seen the payments, uh, the way it is going, uh, the aggregators, account aggregators and so on coming in. We thought we should combine these two and that's how we came with uh, this, uh, you know, how to make it smooth without asking customers for too many things, how based on his approval and what is available in the ecosystem, how we can issue the policy in a seamless manner. Uh, so that customer convenience has been a motivator to come with uh, these kind of solutions. And, uh, you know, to answer more comprehensively our technology initiatives, I would request Satyan uh, to come in now. Satyan, go ahead. Sure. So, so the entire technology phase has been premised on, like Kanan said, at the first level from a protection business point of view, how can we analyze our book and experience better to improve the way we are doing risk management and pricing? And that's what we have been describing multiple times through the conversation today. The second part of the technology initiative has been around integrating with ecosystems. Like Kanan said, to reduce the friction 
of onboarding to the extent that it is possible. But clearly at this point of time, it is also contingent on the customer giving consent. As the entire payment uh, ecosystem evolves and as the account aggregator system evolves, I would expect that to further ease the entire documentation and verification process as far as our own assessment of an individual's earning capacity or a demographic profile are concerned. So as we go ahead, I would only expect the ecosystem information and integration to further ease the way onboarding happens. And clearly, as we capture more and more information about customers, our ability to segment them further and then feed that back into a more customized pricing stroke underwriting process is what will actually set us apart from others. Mm, got it. Yes, sir. Uh, that's very helpful, uh, Steve. Thanks. All the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sue Kumar from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just uh, uh, coming back again to each other's uh, 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 retention strategy. So with uh, uh, our retention strategy now moving to one crore plus, uh, and we are targeting more better demographic customers. So are we also changing our mentality assumptions? Uh, is that so? Uh, does the current pricing take account for that? And are the pricing with margin neutral? Uh, any thoughts on that? So here, the assumption is finally an outcome. The way it is stacking up today is there is a price I'm offering. There is an expected mortality for the underlying segment that is suited for that price. Given that these two are a good fit, we are choosing to retain what we are retaining and offer the price that we are offering. Assumptions eventually will be set once these uh, elements of experience start to crystallize. If the experience emerges as we expect it to, then from a profitability point of view, with the retention strategy and with the pricing strategy that we have now deployed on the ground, we expect the portfolio margins to be at similar levels to what it was before and not be reduced. So that's really the objective, protect margins, ensure that the price and the expected mortality outcome are in sync given the underwriting that we want to deploy and the target market that we want to cater to. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Swarnam Mukherjee from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity again, sir. One quick question on the cost side. So uh, your cost ratios, uh, because so, you know, as you mentioned, the additional manpower hiring and technology investment, they are uh, a bit elevated compared to where it was last year. So, uh, I was wondering uh, what has been based in to the easy calculations uh, at the assumptions were set at the end of the last year. And because of these higher cost ratios, do we expect to, to see any kind of uh, negative impact of, uh, say, uh, operating variance or assumption changes that may happen? when EV gets computed towards the end of the year. So, Swarnab, the expense ratios as we report them, which is the cost to total weighted received premium, whether we like it or not, is a bit of a, uh, a composite measure, which has in the numerator cost and in the denominator all premiums, including renewal premiums. In reality, when we set assumptions for expenses, or when we measure the cost of acquisition of a business, it is more related to new business. And when we measure maintenance cost of a business, it is more related to enforced book. And therefore, from what we are seeing in the current year, while this ratio that you are observing is becoming higher, given that the cost increase is actually less than the new business growth increase, we don't expect any adverse implication from margin point of view arising out of cost. Okay, oh, all right. And I mean, uh, this is also in sync with the assumptions that have been set, right? So that the margins, the the margins that we have used, yeah, the mar the margins that we have reported for nine months for them are based on nine months of actual cost and three months of projected cost. 
when we do full year reporting next quarter it will act, it will be based on the full actual cost for the year there will be no expense overruns okay sir got it thank you so much that's all for me thank you ladies and gentlemen this was the last question for today i would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments uh, thank you thank you once again to everyone for uh, joining the call and uh, asking these questions uh, i do hope that uh, my team and i have answered uh, most of your questions satisfactorily in case anything else uh, is pending or uh, you would like uh, further clarifications please feel to reach out uh, on my team or, or me anytime Uh, thank you once again uh, have a good evening good night bye thank you on behalf of icsa